thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for attending this session on critical minerals. My name's Jane Francis. I'm director of the British Antarctic Survey in the UK. Um, the, the term critical minerals has, has sort of appeared in our conversation over the last few years, as President Gribson has said, as President Gribson has said, because it's really critical for sustainable technology and communications, but also all the industries that we'll, we hope will, will be uh, really important in our future green world. And the reason why it's called critical, there are there minerals that we know about, but the critical uh, uh, really means something to do with the supply, the risk to the supply, rather than them being just critical for our new technologies. Will there be a potential shortage? Can we recycle enough? Is there a risk to the supply? So why the Arctic? There are minerals, there are these critical minerals. Some people call them green minerals, which personally I don't like because some of them are not green at all. But they are critical, they occur around the world, but they are also in the Arctic. So I think if the supply if it is, is, is a shortage in the future, they will be important. It, it will be important that we look at what the Arctic can supply. So we have three different aspects here in our panel to cover three different topics. So can I introduce Karen Handhoy, Director of the British Geological Survey, who is a, an expert on, on minerals. Oysten Ruschfeldt is a mining engineer from a Norwegian copper mining company, Nusir, which aims to be the first fully electrified mine in the world. And Josephine Neumann, Director of the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources and Chair of the Greenland Research Council. So I'm going to hand over to you straight away, Karen. Thank you very much, Jane. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to repeat a few of the things that Jane said, just to be absolutely sure that everyone actually sort of gets the point about criticality. The picture here that I have as my title slide is a picture from East Greenland. And if you look carefully, you can see sort of at the lower middle, there is a drill rig sitting on this glacier. And what this is, is that this is a, an exploration project looking for palladium, a project that I was lucky enough to work on about 20 years ago. And palladium is one of these minerals that we consider critical. Palladium is used in catalytic converters, so it is making hydrocarbons a lot cleaner than they would be if we didn't have catalytic converters. We will see the need for catalytic converters go down as we are phasing out hydrocarbons for main energy sources. But what we'll see instead is that they are also very important in fuel cells, so in hydrogen economy. So we're actually expecting the demand for palladium and other platinum group metals, which is the group it belongs to, to increase quite a lot over the next uh, few decades. So this is a mineral that's typically regarded as critical. And it is found, for example, in the Arctic, but it's found a lot of other places. Right now, it's mostly being mined in South Africa and in Russia. And it's one of the reasons that it is potentially critical is that there is that supply risk. So that is, as Jane sort of said, a really important thing. Everyone's talking about critical minerals. You read about it in all the newspapers. I go to my hairdresser and she asks me about critical minerals and what are we going to do about it. So everyone's kind of interested and everyone has an opinion. But what we really have to remember is that it is not just something that's fun to describe. It's something that we need to find solutions for. We need to look at what's the problem. So critical means that it's very important and at the same time, there is a real supply risk. Palladium is one, rare earth elements, you'll all have heard about them. There's a big supply risk of those. Many of the metals that go into batteries, lithium, cobalt, nickel, these sort of metals you'll have heard about as well, also critical. And again, because it is about the supply risk, that that's what's causing the criticality, it's really important to understand that different minerals are critical for different reasons. There are different reasons that there is that risk. So there's some differences, but there's also some commonalities. And if we look at the commonalities, there's a couple that are really interesting. And one is that almost all of them you could call technology metals. They're metals that go into these energy technologies where we know we're going to need several hundred percent more than we have today. So that's one thing they have in common. And another interesting thing they actually have in common is actually that they are geologically quite available. That doesn't seem to be the issue. And this is a map downloaded this morning from our colleagues in uh, the US, the USGS, and it's their global map 
of mineral deposits of critical minerals. And as you can see, you can see the, the out on the right hand side, you can see the different critical minerals in, in, in their definition. And what you can see is that they are pretty much dispersed around the globe. And this particular projection is terrible because the Arctic looks much, much bigger than it is. But as you can also see, there actually are quite a few deposits in the Arctic. For example, in East Greenland, you can see a red dot that is that deposit I was just showing you a picture of before. So it's not lack of geological availability that's the problem. So why is it actually that we have this supply risk if we have lots of it in the world? And to answer that, I'm just going to look a little bit at what is it actually to be mined when we talk about mining globally? Because we have to look at this from sort of global scale. And what you see in this figure here, if you look to the far left-hand side, you see a big pink column with a bit of blue in it. That's everything we mine in the whole world. And all of the pink is iron. And everything else we mine is that blue rectangle. If we blow, up, if we blow that up to see what's actually in that blue rectangle, what is it else that we're mining other than iron, you can see a few things you might recognize in there. You'll see copper, you'll see manganese, you'll see aluminum, important metals that we all use at home. We know where we use them. But you can see up in the top right-hand corner of that middle, uh, that middle column, there's a black rectangle, and it says technology and precious metals. If you blow that up, you get the right-hand column, and that's what we're mining of precious and technology metals. And there you'll see most of the metals that we call critical. You'll see cobalt, you'll see rare earths, you will see lithium. So quite interestingly, we're talking about the demand are going to increase tremendously for these metals but it's actually still a very small part of the actual mining that we do. And that's important to remember when we talk about critical minerals. Yes, we have to increase the supply dramatically over the next few decades, but at the same time, we're not necessarily adding that much mining if you look at it in a global picture. And what it also shows us is that even though we like to talk about critical metals, and my hairdresser wants to talk about critical metals, all the metals are actually important, and we should think about how we sustainably source all of the metals. And there are basically three ways that we can look at this, this demand and this supply problem. We can try to tweak demand. We can all just use a little bit less. Why don't we do that? That's a very popular solution. Why don't we just use less and we won't have this incredible need to go and dig holes into the ground? Well. I'm not, I don't have time to show you a lot of statistics here or even the sustainable development goals, but I do want to say that 40% of the Earth's population, that is 3 billion people, do not have access to clean energy and they cook over an open fire with tremendous health implications, poverty implications, equality implications. So if we're serious about the sustainable development goals, and we are, then we need more energy globally than we have now. People need more access to clean energy. So using less, can I use less? Absolutely. Can you use less? Probably. And should we? Absolutely. We should. But this is not the solution to the global problem that we have of the green transition. Recycle, another really, really popular option. We all know at home in our doors, we have cell phones in the basement, we have all the electronics, we have all the stereos we ever purchased. It's all piled up down there. Why don't we just, you know, bring it out and put it into a recycling plant and we'll get all that metal out? That's a super good idea. The problem is once we've done that, the basement is empty, the drawers are empty, and we're still looking at something that has an increasing demand every year. So the stock just simply isn't there because the energy transition metals that we're talking about, we didn't use these metals in the past. The stock isn't there. The first generation of metals, we have to dig out of the ground. And that, of course, brings me to the third one, that we do have to mine. And we have to be honest about that. We have to be honest that that will have an environmental impact, just as recycling will, just as farming will, shipping. All of the things that we do for our livelihoods will have an environmental impact. And we have to acknowledge that and then we have to have real conversations about how we can do better and how we can have good standards for doing that globally so that we all sort of having the same values and the same alignment. And I'm going to stop with this slide here, but I just added a couple of more words here because this is, this is sort of what we should be thinking about. We need diverse solutions. We need to 
manage our resources better. We probably do need to consume more sustainably. We do need to align globally on how we, we classify resources, how we manage resources, so that we can guarantee that when we have a gadget like this one, that the metals in it were actually sourced in a responsible way, regardless of whether it was sourced in the Arctic or in Africa. But that's very important. We need to get better at recycling, much better. We need to mine and we need to get better at that as well. And we need to understand the value chains and the supply chains of metals globally so that we can put in place the right solutions. And over to Einstein. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, being invited, and particularly for being invited as a uh, miner. Uh, <laughs> it feels almost like Darth Vader has been invited, uh, Yoda for lunch in the chat. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about uh, one of those uh, metals you just uh, sh saw on uh, Karen's uh, slides. Uh, it was the green box, copper. Actually, uh, copper is a red metal, but uh, it's okay to be green for this audience. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, this metal because this is the metal that uh, we are looking at in this uh, Nusir uh, copper development uh, project uh, at the top of, um, uh, of Norway. So uh, this, this uh, project is a... Um, project that is going to develop the largest copper deposit ever found in Norway. It is one of the cleanest uh, copper ores in the world, and we aim at becoming the first mine in the world with all electric uh, operation, with all renewable energy. So let's uh, have a look uh, how this can be done. But also, uh, I want to um, show you a very important slide first. Uh, mining can't boom like we are hearing many places and just become a part of the problem. If mining is uh, run on diesel, then the additional uh, production of metals will be a part of the problem and not on, uh, of the solution. If mines exclusively become super uh, large open pits with scars in the, uh, uh, in the surface, as we can see on the picture, that is also going to be part of the problem. So this will be an extremely large challenge to balance the climate action that we make, uh, that we help out with, with the metals we produce, but at the same time protecting the environment as good as we can. It's not going to be perfect, but as good as we can. So a few words. Uh, actually, if it's okay with you, Jane, I prefer to stand upright. Uh, I have a, a titanium uh, hip. So it's better uh, to <laughs> shake a little bit loose. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, th thanks for the metals. So um, uh, uh, just a quick figure on what is the big challenge. Uh, we all know that uh, CO2 emissions are just uh, continue booming. The oil and gas, the coal is uh, being burnt as ever before, and there's seemingly no end to, uh, to this situation. So at the same time, there is very, very uh, strong uh, political ambitions, uh, at least in our part of the world, with Fit for 55 and, and similar um, uh, actions suggested. Uh, if, if the Fit for 55 should uh, be uh, fixed on a global basis, the renewable energy production would have to come up from 2,700 to 8,000 gigawatt installed globally. Uh, if that is to be done with one of these more popular uh, devices, which is offshore wind, because that's sort of out of sight and not disturbing too much, then the need for copper will uh, go up from a, around one ton in traditional energy production up to uh, around 15 ton per uh, megawatt. So in order to, to solve this uh, Fit for 55 globally with uh, offshore wind, you would need, need 75 million tons of uh, copper. Is that a big number? Let's see. But uh, in addition to produce energy, you also need to consume the energy in areas where uh, you today have a, a fossil fuel. The biggest uh, uh, sector is uh, obviously transport. There is also industry and buildings and others. 
but transport is the biggest one. There are different areas of transport, heavy road, shipping, ferries, air transport, train, but let's have a look at private cars, which is a big one in, in, in Norway. The sale of the all electric cars has passed 90% uh, uh, this year. So uh, we are already at the 2030 uh, mark, where most car producers in the world today are saying that they will be producing purely all electric cars, maybe around 2030, maybe a couple of years later. The effect of just that transition to have all electric cars taking uh, most of the market in a few years' time, that would need 20 million tons of copper per year, according to uh, Glencore. So again, 75, 20 million ton, is that a lot or is it doable? Let's have a look. This is the production of copper, 600 mines uh, in the world as per today. It's 21 million tons per year. You can see on the graph, it's sort of uh, uh, flattening out. It's difficult to open new mines. I can tell you all about that. So there is no uh, connection between climate goals and access to new copper production. Not at all. It's totally under-communicated. I would call it the biggest bluff in, uh, in modern times. So who's in charge? Who's the smart guys? If there's Chinese people in the audience, I clap for them. Because you can see on this graph who is going to be the supplier of uh, electric cars, of, uh, of windmills, and to do uh, their part of uh, the job. So, thank you. That was the last one. Yeah. So thank you also for, for the invitation. So I work for an institution that advises the Greenland government and sustainable use of the living resources. And this, of course, also includes the environmental footprint or the envi environmental impact of the extractive industry. Uh, so I'm not the government, but I can still uh, talk a little bit on behalf of the government because it, it has been quite clear that uh, it has been important for the Greenland government to try to develop the, uh, the mining industry in Greenland to, to be part of the, uh, so, so Greenland can base its economy also on, on, on mining. Uh, today we don't, though still rely very much on the marine environment, the deep sea stream and the Greenland halibut are the two most important species for, for Greenland economy. So even though um, that the government uh, uh, looks into some uh, other uh, incomes, we still have to consider that whatever industrial development there may be, um, we have to protect the marine environment. It has to be environmentally sound so we don't have the pollution issues. So in order for, for sort of um, facilitating the process uh, for the mining industry and for other industries. Uh, we have developed guidelines uh, through a number of years. I'm not the only one there, others have been involved. Um, and through developing the guidelines, even though we call them guidelines, they're still an integral part of the Mineral Act, so it's part of the, the legal framework. You have to follow the guidelines. And the guidelines are developed not only by us, uh, but of course we, we look at our neighboring countries, the US, Canada, EU, Norway, um, and we have collaborators uh, in, in, all, in all countries. And we constantly adjust the guidelines so we can follow the principles of best available technology and best environmental practice, of course. So um, the the, when all standards, we follow standards, we advise the government to follow standards, of course, like anyone else will do. But the standards are developed, of course, in standardized ways. Uh, and being in a cold climate, we know that things do not react exactly the same way as it does when, when uh, tests are done in, in a lab facility. So we are um, doing tests ourselves, um, and we have different research projects looking at this. We have the lab facilities to do so. And we also work, of course, in the open space. So the need for, for the companies to follow the guidelines, of course, is um, not only because of a social license to, to operate, um, to, to uh, attract investments, but it's also really smart for the companies to do so. Because as you can see here, uh, Citroen Fjord zinc deposit in the northeasternmost part of Greenland. Um, when a company 
30 years ago started to look into uh, the, the baseline studies. They had to, to do measurements on, on everything. They actually found out that uh, the, uh, during the spring flood, um, there's a peak in the release of zinc into the marine environment. It's sort of a natural pollution that takes place every year. And if the baseline hadn't shown that, then the company would have an explanation problem later in the process when the monitoring uh, detected this uh, peak in, in the zinc outlet every spring. So it, it pays off for the company actually to follow these guidelines. Another issue and another thing you have to consider, especially in Greenland where we have very little infrastructure, this is the Nellonak gold mine, which is an underground gold mine in South Greenland. It's not operating at the moment, uh, but it has been and it probably will be again in the near future. So you can see the road following the, the stream down through the valley. Um, the infrastructure is something you have to consider as well as being part of the environmental footprint. Um, you have to consider post-closure, should, should we leave it here because the local community would like it to be so, or should it be removed, uh, or what should happen with it? So all these considerations uh, are part of the, of the final decision, and this is something that we, as advisors, provide the government to, so they can make a decision based on, on uh, all, um, to the knowledge of all possible impacts that could have been. So I think I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. So if anybody would like to um, ask a question, could you raise your hand? So there's one, one here. Thank you. Yeah, there's one over there. So. Hi, I'm uh, Rocky Whites. I'm Director of Maritime Studies at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, I cover this stuff a lot in my energy transition lectures, and nobody knows about it. So uh, we have a critical information problem. Uh, how do we fix it? Well, we come here, <laughs> and that's, exa that's exactly why we're here. Like I said, every, everyone talks about this, but without knowing anything about it, and that is actually one of the issues, uh, and I do tell my hairdresser that as well. So, so I think that we, 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 we must have these honest conversations about it, because there is that tendency that we want. There was, a, there was someone in the last session here in the plenary that says, People, especially politicians, they, want, they don't like complexity. They want simple solutions. Everyone's looking for the silver bullet. Let's recycle. Let's uh, marine, uh, marine mining. Let's do this. We, it's complex, and that's okay, and we need to talk about it. Mm. Also, it's quite interesting, actually, when we suggested this topic some time ago, because it feels like this is the beginning of a long conversation about critical minerals, and yet there are three sessions in this, in this meeting, which is quite interesting. So it's really, I think, the beginning of a big, big conversation and a, and a big pro, a problem. It also includes, of course, deep sea mining. Yeah. We want the products of these metals, but they don't come with an easy solution. And it's something we need to work out. And I think in the old days, we may have just gone ahead and mined, but I think these days we're much more environmentally conscious and hopefully we'll eventually do it the right way. Next question. There's a lady there in the middle. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask. My name is Pirila Nakkelervi. I am a member of the Sami parliament on the Finnish side. And I have a question to uh, CEO of uh, Nusser, Mr. Rushfield. Um, what weight do you give on the concerns raised by the indigenous people Sami about the Nusser mine project? For example, uh, the dumping of toxic waste into the fjord, building a mine in an important Sami reindeer herding area and by an important salmon river. And I've also understood that a major buyer of the production of your mine project uh, recently withdrew from a letter of intent due to red flags appearing in due diligence in the area of corporate social responsibility. So it's not only us indigenous people, Sami, raising the concerns. But what weight do you give uh, on these concerns in your decision making? Thank you. Yes, uh, that is a, a big question and I think we would need quite some time, so I'm quite available to discuss this with you after if you're not getting a full answer during this session. But uh, during all these uh, 15 years I've been working with the project, 
there is no other group that I have had more meetings and consultations and chats, coffee, uh, uh, coffee meetings or, or town hall meetings than with uh, the reindeer herders and the uh, Sami parliament uh, and, and related uh, Sami um, bodies. So uh, uh, some of the statements you made are, are incorrect, so it will take quite some time to, uh, to uh, go through that, but we can do that uh, afterwards. And I'm afraid that we are getting the wrap-up message. I have a follow-up question on, on, on that, if you please permit. Very quick, a very quick one, thank you. Yes, um, on the website of NUS, um, they've written that there have been many years of consultation between the company and local groups, including the indigenous Sami. And as the last question said, in 2018, there was a letter that was sent to Citibank and then the Fidelity Canada branch that Sami Parliament wanted them to offset their interest in NUSIR. And so if this was done, I'm wondering what kind of consultation happened and what is the idea of consultation? Um, about what, what does NUSIR think about consultation? Is he only talking to indigenous peoples or actually getting their consent as international law prescribes? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I mentioned the, uh, the number of consultations has been more for, uh, compared to any other group that we have consulted uh, uh, than the uh, Sami uh, parliament. And it's been very uh, open consultants. They started on, on day one uh, when uh, very few details of the project was uh, clarified and they were made uh, changes to the project uh, on the way during these uh, times of uh, consultation. So I would say that the, the consultations, uh, when they were active and with an open dialogue in good faith, that they were uh, good uh, consultations. Since then, uh, Sami Parliament decided to withdraw from uh, consultations, which is a, uh, a, a big pity, in my opinion. And I do hope that uh, they would uh, return back and, and uh, have a, a, uh, participate in a dialogue with, uh, in open faith. Thank you very much. We really are over time now, so we will finish. But uh, as you can see, it is a, clom a complex matter. It will require a lot of more consultation and decisions in the future. But Oystein said he will be available afterwards for, for a discussion with anybody who would like. So thank you very much for, this, for your attention this session. Thank you.